ask the choir if they would to make their way up. Could the choir, you guys come on up. While the choir's making their way up, I just want to take a moment. There's a few people here I've never, I've never seen before. If you're a first-time visitor, would you mind just, I don't embarrass anyone, we just want to make you feel welcome here. First-time visitor, would you mind just standing up if you're here for the first time? All right. Hey, if somebody is standing up beside you, just extend a hand, make them feel welcome. Those folks that are standing up, we have some ushers around. They may pass out a uh, information card if you're interested. You want to fill that out. We want to be able to not harass you. We want to be able to let you know about what, what's hap what happens here at the church on a regular basis. So if you want to take that, there might be somebody in the back that will uh, take it from you outside in the foyer out there, and they'll give you a little gift, and, uh, and we'll, send, we'll, we'll put you on an email list to let you know what we do here. So grateful to have you, and um, just want to apologize for the weather. I, uh, we wanted to do this outside. We were hoping we'd be able to kind of take church to the streets, but how many of you are thankful we moved inside? Wow. Okay, so the rest of you, we got to pray for you because I can't take that heat. But um, interestingly enough, when we went to go move it inside, uh, the air condition here has been a little sketchy over the past couple of weeks, but we, we came in at the beginning of the week and we sat down with uh, the folks here, which they've, re they've really tried hard to, to help us and to accommodate the air condition, but it, they, they tried to fix it. And last night they were like, there's not much else we can do. And uh, we just thought, well, it's instead of 115 degrees outside, it'll just be 95 in here. It's an improvement. But uh, this morning, thank God, they, uh, one of the fellows came in early and tried yet again to fix it. So we, we, we've got a little better than 95. I think we're probably somewhere in the 80s. So thank God for that. Thank God for if they're here, if they're listening, for the people from the school, from the maintenance staff that made the effort to, to come and try to make this as comfortable as they could for us. Yeah, without any uh, further ado, in case you don't know me, my name is Pastor Brian Petrie, and um, on behalf of the Manhattan Grace family, we are so thankful that you're here. Would you put your hands together for the choir?
Ask the ushers if they would to come forward. We're going to take a, an offering right now. now. If you're here for the first time and you say, I'm coming to church and man, they're hitting me up for an offering, you don't have to, we're not asking you to give anything here. In fact, if you're from another church and um, this isn't your church home, we, uh, we wouldn't ask you to, to give a tithe here either. Um, what we want is we want to be able to continue the work that we're doing right now. If you've been invited here, flyers were passed out on the street, things that we put online. Um, somebody personally invited you, however you got here. Like, we're here, we have to rent this place. And we want to not just rent a place where we can have services. We want to do as much as we can in the community to try to love the community. Today is there's no greater love. That's what we're here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate the fact that there is no greater love in this world above Jesus. And so we give ourselves as a church here to that cause, to lifting up his, his name and making him known. And the Bible says if you're going to give, then give give willingly, give with joy. And if that's not a place that you're in today, totally understand that. If you're here today and you can't give because you don't have the ability to give, that's, that's fine, just the same. But what we do want to do is uh, we want to be able to honor God with the blessing that he's given us so that we can continue to lift his name up and bring blessing to this community. Father, we thank you today for Jesus. We thank you for all that he's done and all that means to our lives. We're here to sing songs about him. We're here to get testimony about him. We're here to remind what the word says about all that that blessing means to our life. And God, we want to be able not just to do this in a moment, but we want to be able to do it in a way that allows us to continue to make that incredible love known to the world. So take what we're about to give. God bless it that through it, Jesus, we might continue to lift up your name. It's in that great name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Choir's going to sing another song.
Come on, let's really put our hands together. Well, that's what we're here today for, to remind all of our, beginning with myself, to remind us that there is no greater love. And I'm so excited to introduce this friend of mine, his name's Ron Olivier. Ron, if you would, come up. He's got a story of how God's love has been so made real in his life, and he came all the way up from Louisiana uh, to, to encourage all of us. So if you would, we're clapping a bit, but would you put your hands together for our brother Ron Olivier? Amen. Come on, get a Lord a hand of praise. Come on, that was good for me. I thank you. Come on, we'll give him a hand of praise. Come on, give him a big, 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 big hand. Come on, he worried it. Come on, I know he done brought you through some things too. Come on, I'm not the only miracle standing here. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, you know like you know like you know that God done brought you through some things. Hallelujah. I'm certainly, man, I'm thankful to be here. Man, this is a blessing. I, I, I feel like I'm dreaming. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a blessing. Certainly thank God for Pastor Brian for allowing me this opportunity to share my, my testimony. Amen. Certainly thank God for my wife there. Amen. Come on. Come on, you can clap. Amen. She make me clap. Hallelujah. Certainly thank God for her and we um, you can keep us in prayer. We're expecting a, a child. Amen. <laughs> Make me want to dance. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful. Um, man, God has been so, so, so good to me. Man, he's so awesome. Um, just last year around this time, I was in prison. I was in Louisiana State Penitentiary, I'm in Angola, Louisiana, and I had a life sentence. Um, man, it's amazing. Um, well, let's start here. I, I grew up in the city of New Orleans. Anybody ever heard of New Orleans? Yeah. Yeah, man. And man, I grew up in a, a very poverty-stricken um, neighborhood. It was it was filled with with violence and drugs. I mean, they know where drugs is. Violence follows. And so I grew up in an in a atmosphere where, man, it was normal to hear gunshots. It was normal to see bodies. It was normal to see blood. And as a result of that, at the age of 16, I found myself in prison for first degree murder. I had killed one man and, and wounded another man. And this is about 1993, I'm on trial for first degree murder. You know, I'm 16, Every, everything seemed like a joke up until this point. I'm, I went to trial and the jury is deliberating and I'm in a holding tank by myself. Everything got real. And I went to think and they got 12 people that don't know anything about me, about to make a decision on my life, whether I live or die. And from that moment, I got on my knees and began to pray. I remember my mama used to always tell me, she said, if you ever get in trouble, you call on Jesus. Yeah. Come on, I called on him in that cell. And could I tell you, he showed up. I had this simple prayer, I said, Lord, and a lot of people say, don't make deals with God. I made a deal with him. I say, Lord, if you don't let them kill me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Come on, I'm here today. Yeah. Amen. He, he took care of his and I'm steady trying to keep my end. Amen. Amen. And so he saved me, man. He, he, I, I, for the first time, I experienced the peace of God. Come on, I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew they wasn't going to kill me. And so when I got back in the courtroom, they found me guilty of second-degree murder, a lesser offense, and second-degree, and I, I didn't know any of this. Mind you, I'm 16, and, and all these legal terms are just going over my head, and I have a public defender, and 
I didn't know that second degree murder carried a mandatory life sentence without benefits of parole or probation, which means you die in prison. And so, man, that, that, that hit me, but I, was, I felt all right. I was with God, amen? I knew he was going to bring me up. All through my life in prison, I spent 26 years, 11 months, and three days in prison. I just came home in, in November. And, and man, all through my stay through prison, I always knew that I wasn't going to die in prison. Come on, I, I just knew it. I can't explain it. I didn't know how. I didn't know when. I just knew who. Come on, that, that'll preach right there. If you can get the who, he'll take that care of the how and the when. Come on, you can say amen. Come on, talk to me. And so, man, God began to change my life. Even though I was saved, and he saved me at that moment in that holding cell, it didn't look like I was saved. Come on, you know when a newborn baby comes out, it don't, it don't look <laughs> like the little pretty Gerber baby, huh? <laughs> Come on, we always say, oh, that's the pretty baby. You know that baby now. <laughs> and, so, and so the baby comes forward out of a womb with all this afterbirth, all this, all this gook on it. it. It looks nasty. It has to be cleaned up. And so when I got born again, I looked like what I came out of. Come on, I was still cussing. Come on, y'all act like y'all don't, y'all never heard a cussing Christian. Well, y'all don't, don't curse in there, all right. And so I went through this process, man, and, and, and God, God went to sending people in my life to help disciple me, to help teach me the word. And, and the greatest difference was this, even though I was doing some of the, the same things, and saying some of the same things, the, the difference was that, man, I was getting convicted now. I didn't feel comfortable saying those things. Come on, you with me? Yeah. And so, man, and so God with the change in my life, changing my life, just, just, just putting it back piece to, by piece. And by 1995, something miraculous happened that they, the, the prison on warden allowed them to establish an, it, an extension center a Bible college there. And so the Bible college comes and New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and it affords you to get a, 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 um, a degree in Christian ministry. And so, man, I went into Bible college and, man, I, I got a degree, a, a bachelor's degree in Christian ministry. <laughs> and, and so after that, what happens is your job begins to be a, an inmate minister. Your job is to go around and just Minister to people. And man, that was awesome. And also, you have an opportunity to be a missionary. Isn't that crazy? You're a missionary in prison. <laughs> I'm talking about this mind boggling. So, what they'll do, you, you can volunteer to go to another prison to assist a chaplain and, and pastor churches. And so, I went to another prison, and, and man, God began to bless me. Man, I, I never forget the day I got off the bus. It just so happened that the pastor, the inmate pastor that was there, he was, he was discharged in that 1201. So the chaplain brings me on the platform, on the stage, and he introduces me to the congregation as the new pastor. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. I laughed, too. <laughs> and so I'm like, man, what's going on? And so, um, man, that, that, that chaplain that was there, man, we had got a relationship, and Man, you got to be careful and be mindful of who God brings into your life. I try to walk with one ear to heaven and one ear to earth. Because God is always connecting you to people. But they got a flip side of that. The devil connects some people to, to you, amen, to bring you down. So here it is. God connects me to this man of God. And soon after about four years, I go back to Angola and still operating in ministry. But... Later, this man of God, he, he spoke on my behalf at the parole board. And he gave me two jobs when I came home. He's also the mayor of the town that I live in. Come on, man. You see how God hooking this thing up? He'll put it together. And, man, it's crazy. He, get, he gave me a place to stay. 
Why? You know this God, rent free. <laughs> Come on, somebody ought to shout it right there. <laughs> And so, man, God just began to continue to bless me. And even on my job just recently, man, this is crazy. I, I got a promotion. And his, his hand is on. I'm talking about the favor of God is just up on my life. And, and I've been going share it everywhere I can share it. Man, look, I don't care what you're going through, what situation you're in. Come on, don't give up. I'm telling you, don't give up. I'm telling you, God delivered me from prison. Come on, if he could deliver me from that situation and change my life, I don't care what you are going through. He'll do it. Come on, he's not a respecter of person. He's just a respecter of faith. Come on, how many of you believe him? The Bible says this in John 10, 10, it says, the thief come but the what? Come on, y'all been reading y'all Bible. Still, the kill, he... That's his agenda. And that's what he was trying to do me. But I love what the, what, the, what the second part of that verse says. It said, but he came that we might have life. Come on, and have it more abundant. I love how the Amplified Bible says. The Amplified Bible says this. It says that we might have and enjoy life in abundance to the full until it overflows. Come on, that's, that's a triple positive right there. In abundance. Man, that's awesome. And that's how my life been. And I just want to bless you with that, man. I, I pray that God do something in your life. Don't give up. The Bible says this, Romans, Romans I think, 828. It's saying, we know that all things work together for the good. Come on, he'll work it together for the good, amen? I'm talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. he work it all together, and he'll do something with it, amen? amen? So I encourage you with that, man, no matter what you're going through. The Bible said that, man, as Christians, we, we shall have tribulations. Come on, that's, that, it's coming. You're going to have trouble. If somebody told you once you give your life to God, it's going to be all right, I'm here to tell you that's a lie. I'm telling you, hell will break out on you because of that. Amen? But I like how the Apostle Paul said in Romans, the fifth chapter, he said, tribulation, it works something. It works patience. And, and your patience work experience. And your experience work, come on, it gives you hope. That you are not ashamed because the love of God, come on, there it is, is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Come on, how many know God really loves you? Man, he's so in love with us. He's so, look, I can remember this when I was in a Bible college. I was, I had went through this moment where I'm like, man, Lord, what's going on? This, this how my life ends? Is, is, is this it? I know this ain't how it's supposed to be. And man, God brought something to my memories that, man, I know it had to be him. I was like in second grade. And, and mind you, um, I come from a broken home where I always went by my father on the weekends in the summer. And so here it is. I'm, I'm in the living room. It's after school. I have my school bag. I'm waiting on my father to come pick me up on a Friday for the weekend. I had my little bag of clothes, and I'm sitting there, and I'll never forget, I fell asleep waiting on him. The sun went to going down. And my mother woke me up. She said, baby, just go, go, go get in the bed. It don't look like your daddy coming. I said, I said, he told you that? And the thing was, he had never said he was coming and didn't come. My father had never stood me up. And I said, he said that? She said, no. I said, well, he coming then. I said, he coming. And about 10 minutes later, the doorbell rang, and that was my dad. I jumped in his arms. And God went to remind me, he said, if your, if your, heaven, if your earthly father, being evil, didn't forget you, how much more your heavenly father? He said, I'm coming to get you. Could I tell you? Daddy came and got me. 
I'm standing here because Daddy Cam got me. Amen. And I'm so grateful, man, to, to be here. And I, and I want you to know, come on, how many, how many named the name of Christ in here? Amen. Come on, that, come on, you got a daddy too. And he'll come get you. I don't care what situation you're in. Amen. He'll deliver you. He'll clean you up and use you to help other people. Ain't that something? Where I was once hurting people and, and, and killing, he's using me to give life. Amen. One more thing, and I'm going to take my seat. When I, when I was, sharing, when I was um, being re centered well, God had changed the law for me. They miraculously, man, that's how I'm home, and they changed the law. The United States Supreme Court came down with a ruling, and, and Alabama versus um, Virginia said that um, Miller versus Alabama, and they said that it was unconstitutional to give a juvenile a mandatory life sentence. And so they had to re me. So I'm going through this, this phase. And I never forgot, man, during the trial, man, I, I can't remember all the people that were there. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you how the judge looked or my lawyer or the DA. But this lady, the, the, the lady whose son I had killed, her, her, mind, her, her face burned in my mind. And so when I got born again, I started seeing things from a different perspective, and I started I start praying for her. And I had this, this yearning desire to meet this lady and just, man, just ask her to forgive me. And I used to always see those things on TV and, man, just, just want that. And, and so here it is. I'm going back and forth to court, and here it is. The lady, she shows up. I remember her. I knew it was her. And... And man, I, I had requested to, um, to speak with her. And so this particular time, she said whatever, she said she didn't want to talk to me then. She said whatever she had to say, she's going to say it on the stand. So I just kept on praying. And so when the, they set me back and when the, the hearing finally came, she decided to speak with me. I, sp I spoke with her about 45 minutes. This is the hardest conversation I ever had. And the first thing I did I, was, I took ownership of what happened. You know, I told her, I said, ma'am, look, I take ownership of what happened. I said, man, I, I killed your son. I'm not here to make any excuses. I said, I just ask you to forgive me. And the lady forgave me. She said, I forgive you. And she said this year, she said, I want to see you home. She said, I believe you deserve a second chance. And she got on the stand and echoed that. Come on, that ain't nothing but God, yeah. And so I'm here, man. I come, I come all the way from Louisiana just to tell you three words. Don't give up. Come on, I don't care what's going on. Don't give up. Keep pressing. Keep trusting God. And I promise you, he'll come through. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Amen. Well, I, I, I totally believe that we have to continue to fight. We can't give up in one way, but in another way, we do need to give up. And that's what I want to just spend a second talking about. Audrey, if we have that, just uh, Psalm 50, 51, 17, just that verse. Let's look at a verse really quick. And I just want to use this to help all of us to fight in one way, but to give up in another. It says this, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Just take a, take a moment think about that. God actually delights in a, broken, in a broken and a contrite heart. Doesn't that seem odd to you? Doesn't it seem odd that God would actually like take pleasure in watching you and I get broken? I remember the first time I read that, I thought, oh, wait, I thought God was supposed to be a God of love. We're here today celebrating there's no greater love than the love that God has for us. But that love is something that gets obstructed because of us. And that's why I want to look at this verse, because I think this is so important. I want to talk for a moment just about how life breaks us. Why would God delight in breaking me? Well, it could be argued that God doesn't break us. We actually break ourselves. 
And there's so many things that come to all of us in so many different ways. We, we look different. Some of us have hair, some of us don't. Some are short, some are tall, some are different colors of skin. Whatever the, the variations are, there's just as many variations that break us. Some of us are raised in ways where um, maybe a dad abandons us. Maybe a brother sexually abuses us. Maybe um, both parents don't really give the attention to a child that a child needs to grow in the way that they're supposed to. Or maybe somebody grows up in a way where they're blessed in so many different ways, but then they... Um, they get into relationships with friends and friends disappoint them, friends turn on them. It could be somebody in school gets bullied. It could be somebody gets married and a spouse is unfaithful to them. Whatever those variations are, everybody has something imposed on them in life that they don't want. You're here today and you have something that's been imposed on you in your life and you can say, man, Really, God, like you would allow this to happen? Why, why would you allow something to happen? It, it, it hurts so deeply. Well, come back to that in a second, but just want to acknowledge that everybody here in some way has been broken. I've been broken. I grew up in a single home, messed up situation, circumstance like a soap opera. And I can tell you, up until I was 18 years old, there was nothing that I found to be good about the brokenness that didn't seem to continue to be imposed on me. Um, but whatever my challenge is and whatever your challenge is, everybody here is, uh, is really broken in the same spot. And it's, it's in our heart. God delights in a broken heart. But what, what's in the heart? What was the heart made for? The heart was made to be loved. My heart was made to receive love. Your heart was made to receive love. We're celebrating today that there's no greater love than the love of God. Whatever has happened to you in your life and whatever things have done to, to you in some way that have made you feel like your life doesn't have value, that brings a brokenness to your life brings a brokenness to my life. It's, it's what makes me begin to like try to figure out how do I manage my life in a way that I don't experience more brokenness. Everybody does it. Everybody in here, everybody in here is a control freak in some way. And what are we trying to control? We're trying to control life from instilling more pain on me. You know, when we're born into a family and we think the family's supposed to love us and then the family in some way turns on us and a dad abandons us and a mom isn't able to give us what we need and we start to feel like somebody doesn't care about me, well, what do we do with that? What do we do when a husband abandons us or abandons a wife and has a relationship with somebody else? What do we do with that? What do we do when a, when a kid that you raise and you love him, it turns on you and acts like you were never a good parent? Like all of these things, what do they do? The common denominator is they inflict pain in my heart. It brings a brokenness to me that makes me begin to like stop and go, how do I deal with this? Now, whatever has been imposed on you, we all share this common denominator. We all just want to be loved. But this is where it gets a little bit different for each person here. How do I deal with not getting what I should have gotten? Some people turn to drugs. Some people could turn to, you know, getting involved in gangs and, and trying to make money. Because if you grow up poor, what do you don't want to be poor? So you do whatever you need to with whatever opportunities are available to you to begin to try to solve the problem. I don't want to feel like I can't take care of myself. I don't want to be in a position where I don't feel loved. So you do what you do. Or you get into a position where somebody turns on you and they, and they go in a different direction where they're supposed to be loving you as a spouse and you say, well, what do I do with that? Some people can pick up a, a bottle and start drinking. There's all kinds of creative ways that each person in here has made a choice in their life to deal with the broken thing that has been imposed on you. Now, this is where God begins to delight in brokenness. He never delights in somebody not being loved. He never delights in the ways that somebody gets broken. He doesn't delight in the fact that it leaves you in a place where you're now trying to figure out what to do. These things don't bring pleasure to God, but this thing does. And this is what I want to get you to focus on for a second. What have you made choices to do to deal with your brokenness today? How have you thought about your own creative way of dealing with it? Whatever that is to you, you got to say, you got to stop, and you got to be honest with yourself. When my brother was sitting in a holding pen at 16 years old, and he had made choices in his life that led him to the place that he landed, and he realized, you know what, I don't like the place that I've made for myself. I don't like where this is leading. It's, I mean, his life is like a picture of what we all go through. We're all eventually going to lose life because of the choices that we make. It's called death. 
Sin leads to death. Sin is me making a choice to do life on my terms in my way to get what I think is best for me. And at 16 years old, as he's sitting in that pen, and he's realized, I've really messed this thing up. This wasn't just a party up until now. I was making big boy decisions that now have big boy consequences, and I don't like where that leaves me. Oh, God, if you're there, if you care, my mom said, help me in that place. He found brokenness that God does delight in. See, God delights in getting each one of us to a place where we realize our choices don't work. Our way leads to death. And in that place, God is saying, would you please stop? I didn't create you for the mess of this world. I didn't create you to get creative with the ways that you're dealing with how the dysfunction of your life can be addressed and brought healing. And, and, and you can find the life that he was talking about. I didn't create you for any of this. I created you for love. But I can't give you something if you're going to make a choice to do it your way. See, God delights in me realizing that my way doesn't work. And he'll let you, you could be in here today and it could be, you know, adding on, piling on. You could be the 60 year old man strung out on heroin. I just talked to somebody out on the street. He's like, I, you know, I need help. I need help. Okay, great. But where's that help going to begin? It's going to begin in the position of you realizing whether it's heroin, whether it's some relationship you're in that you know isn't pleasing to God, whatever it might be, it begins with you saying, this does not work. My way is the wrong way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You will not know God. You will not know this greater love that you were made for in your approach. You'll only know it if you make a choice to stop your way and begin to trust him for his way. And that's why you get to this part of the scripture where it says he delights in a contrite heart. He delights in somebody getting to a place where they get so broken in their own attempt that they stop and they go, I'm sorry. You know, contrition is like really it's making an apology to somebody saying, hey, I offended you. I was wrong. I want to make up for it. But in a spiritual way, it's coming to God and it's saying to God, it's saying, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I, I know that my way is leading to death. I can't stop it, which brings me to the point of what Jesus came into the world for. Jesus came into the world to help me break that power that controls me, that drives me into a grave. Every person in here, without the help of Jesus, is stuck and controlled by a power that commands them, that continually makes them figure out how they're going to control their life in a direction that doesn't make sense. That's, that's how we all know sin is real and its power is commanding. Why do I continue to go in the same direction I know is wrong? Because there's a force inside of me that's greater than I can control. There's no discipline that can manage sin. But there is a Savior who can. And so what do you do with that? You got to get to a place, and it's the reason that we've taken time out today to invite you here. If you're a visitor, if you've come before, but you haven't been for a while, and you're not going to church, and you're thinking about God, but you realize, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to get back to that familiar place of saying, okay, God, I'm done, then just know this. God doesn't despise in a spirit that's broken, realizing he can't do it on its own, and he doesn't despise a spirit that says, I'm sorry, God. But what he does despise, because there's verses that precede this that say, you can continue to try to make this life what you think it is. You can continue to try to make some sort of approach, even to connect with God, like where you're kind of caught up in like church and you're caught up in your own religious understanding and you're going through the motions. Well, I read my Bible and I pray. David, this, the, the guy who wrote this psalm, he, was committed, he had committed murder. He had committed adultery. He had committed murder. He had gotten involved in things that took him farther than he thought it would ever take him. And then once he got there, for over a year, a commentator speculate that he stayed in this position where he continued to do things like that were religious. Like he might go to the temple. He might be responsible for making offerings. But God goes, I don't want those offerings. They don't mean anything to me. In fact, I despise those kind of offerings because your heart's not in it. You're not in a position of surrender. You haven't yielded yourself to the way that I've set up. There, this is to somebody in here that thinks that just coming to church or you know, watching some guy on television means that you have a relationship with Jesus. A relationship with Jesus begins in a place of surrender. It begins in a place of saying, I'm contrite, God, I get it. Now, I'm not going to tell you what your way is. I'm not just going to go to church and continue to stay in control. I'm going to surrender to Jesus, and I'm going to follow him with whatever that means. Well, what does that mean? It means this. Jesus said, there is no other way but through me. Well, what's his way? 
He's the Savior. You can't save yourself. You can't clean yourself up. You can't deliver yourself from its power, sin. You have to trust Him for what that means. Well, how do I make application of that in my life? How are you broken? What things are you jammed up in today? What things are controlling you? What things are driving you as your solution to your problem? Whatever that is, just think for a moment. I don't care if you're not a Christian or if you are a Christian because you can be in both positions and still have sin control you. But the only way God's going to help you, the only way he's going to help me is if I get to that place of being broken. And brokenness says, no longer my will, your way, Jesus. Jesus, what is your way? He's not asking you to change yourself. He's asking you just to acknowledge what he's done. Well, what has he done? He came into this world. He lived in a, a perfect life, a life that you could never live. For what purpose? So that he could take your record of, ex of sin and exchange it for his ref record of perfection. He came into the world so that whatever the judgment is, it, listen, if this brother got convicted of murder, they're not just going to take him into court and go, okay, you got a second degree account over your life. Hey, go have a great life. Nobody would do that. They would go, no, if that's what he did, then he's going to serve the, the, the time that goes along with the crime. That's, that makes sense. It would be irresponsible for him to not be held responsible for that. And it would be irresponsible of loving God to just let people go do whatever they want after they say, I'm sorry, but they continue to live underneath the power of sin. Jesus came to deliver us from that power. And Jesus came to break that power on the cross. So he came to take the record of sin. And he came to take its power. And he judged it so that in breaking it on a cross, we could be freed from it. He buried it in a grave. And if somebody will put their hope in what he has done today, whether you're an unbeliever or somebody who's struggling in their faith to live in that broken, contrite place, if you'll turn to him and say, I'm sorry, your way is right, my way is wrong, would you, Jesus, begin to help me today so that I can get beyond these things that inhibit me from knowing your incredible love? There is no greater love than the love of God. How do you come to know that? You actually have to own your life. You have to repent. There are no victims in this room, beginning with me. I didn't ask for the brokenness that was imposed on me but I was responsible for how I made choices to deal with it. And in so much of my life, I've made a choice, and so have you, to respond in a way that wasn't trusting God for what that means. And today's an opportunity. Today's an opportunity where you can say, you know what, God? I'm tired of my way, and I'm tired of the brokenness that it continues to bring me. You didn't die for this. You died so that I would know life in an abundant way, in a super abundant way. He said a triple blessing. I forget the three words that he said to talk about what that life is supposed to mean, but it's, it, God wants to bless us beyond the blessing that we could even trust him for. But he can't do it if you stay in control. He won't do it if you don't trust him with all of your heart. So if you're here today, and I'm going to ask the musicians if you'd begin to play something. We just want to give you an opportunity. The whole point of today, if you've got a flyer on the street, if you've got a water, why are we doing this? We're reminding you today of the greatest love of all, the love of Jesus Christ. And he wants to meet you in your place of need. And he's got the ability to do it. I'm testifying to it. Ron testified to it. I could let any member up here in the choir testify to it. But the question is today, do you know it? And not just, have you, have you come to faith and put your faith in Jesus Christ five years ago or 10 years ago? Today, are you living in a place of brokenness and contrition? At 31 years being saved, I'm more convinced today that I'm broken than I ever was at 18 years old. I'm more convinced today that I need Jesus and my way always goes in the wrong direction than I was the moment that I confessed him as Savior. And I'm thankful for that because that makes me wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I'm done. I'm done with my way. I want to trust you for yours. God, thank you that you delight today in even this position that I find myself in because this position is the beginning of you being able to help me. I'm broken. God, I repent. I'm sorry. Now, would you, would you begin to help me? Would you give me a new lease today on the rest of my life? Now, imagine this, Jesus. He did all this for us when we were fighting against him. How much more if we'll just yield to him, stay in a place of broken contrition? How much more will he be able to bless us as his children? If you're here today and you've never confessed Jesus as a savior, you've up to this point in your life, you've lived in a way where you've tried to manage it on your own. You might come to church once in a while thinking that that might make a difference, 
doesn't, church doesn't change anybody, only Jesus can. You can come to church and know about Jesus and not trust him. If you're here today and for the first time, you want to trust Jesus. You want to say, I'm broken because of my choices. And I'm in this place where I, I know I need to repent. I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. Why am I asking you to stand up? Jesus hung in a public way. He hung naked for the world to see because he wasn't ashamed to take on your shame for the, in, in the love that he had for you. And Jesus said this, these aren't my words. If you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father in heaven. That's not manipulation. That's his words. I'm not trying to get you to stand because you're living in fear. I'm trying to provoke you to a place that if he would hang for you in love, then you can stand for him in your brokenness. If you're here today and you say, Jesus, I'm done. I want to give up. Then you can stand. If you're here today and you've known Jesus, but you've turned your own way, you've gone back uh, in the direction of being unbroken, being unrepentant, just, hey, God, I'm going to do it my way, and whatever that means, it doesn't matter. I'm not really going to repent of this. I'm going to continue to hold on to my way because it's what I want in spite of how you bled out for me. If that's you, if you need to make this as maybe your position where you've just I've done it many times in 31 years, unfortunately, where I've drifted from God. If you've drifted from God today, but you've known him, but you want to put yourself in a position today of trusting him afresh, I'm going to ask you to stand up. You want to acknowledge your brokenness before God. You want to acknowledge your contrition before God. Just stand up. I don't get anything out of you standing up. This is an act of faith that God will honor. give you a moment. There's no pressure. We're not in a rush here. The singers are going to start to lead us in this song. And as they do, um, I know there's a, a lot of folks here, and I trust everybody is in a place today of being broken by their choices, being broken by their sin, in a position of just living surrender to Jesus. That's amazing. And you're living in a place of humility, of contrition, of God, I need you. I don't want to do this anymore on my own. If that's, if that's where you are, that's amazing. But in a room with this many folks, I've done this once or twice, I know that there's probably a few more that need to stand in faith and say, Jesus, meet me, help me today, help me today. Sing that with him. The sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found was mine, but now I see my change. sitting, maybe we can all just pray this together. Can you just repeat after me? Father, thank you today for Jesus. 
Thank you for his way. It's right and it's true. I've chosen my way. It never leads to life. Today, I turn from my way. And I trust you for your way. Will you help me by the power of your spirit to walk in a way that honors you? God, I thank you for the people that are standing. And God, I thank you for the boldness of their faith. And Lord, I thank you in the days to come, even as they stand here and they've humbled themselves, even before you and everyone here, they've stood to say, I need you. My way is not right. God, I thank you that your eyes search the earth for such people as this. And God, your promise to them is you'll give them all that they need, that they might live in a way that knows that love and live in a way that allows that love to be made real through their lives to the world around them. God, I pray your blessing over them. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to, to trust you day in and day out and the dependency that allows your love to continually meet them. Pray that you would do this. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask the rest of us, can we just stand up for a second? I want to sing this song. It'll be a kind of a closing prayer, a benediction of sorts as we sing. Thanking God for his grace committing our lives afresh to it. so many of you would make your way out on a day that's this hot. Um, pray that God's blessing will be upon you and cool you down as you make your way through the rest of the day and the week. I want to remind you on Wednesday night, we didn't make announcements, but on Wednesday night, we have a prayer meeting in here. And to us, we really believe that this is the most important meeting of a church family that we can have. We want to invite you out. If you've never been to it, come out. We're going to stand and trust God to do great things. He actually did something great. We had air conditioning in here this morning. We were all praying, and they told us it wasn't going to happen. And you pray, and God does something. So if you have something that you need prayer for, whether it's personal or it's somebody that you know in your family or your circle of friends, come out Wednesday night. Trust God and see what he can do. He wants to do great and mighty things. Our brother standing here today is a testimony of how prayer can deliver somebody even from a life sentence. Amen? Amen. So... I want to thank God for Ron. I want to thank God for all the hard work that was put into this week, even though we weren't able to be outside. God bless you. Before you leave, show somebody some love. Give them a smile, a handshake. Have a great week. I've been set free.